Um, it's so good to see you guys this morning. Thank you for hanging out with us. It's always an honor to be able to share the word. I'm going to dive right into this message in just a moment. Uh, I do hope that you've had a chance to be a part of our prayer gatherings across the locations. We had one in the central time zone right here at Russell Springs, one in the eastern time zone over in Camelsville, and the Swans did a phenomenal job of just sowing into our lives, enhancing our understanding of prayer, and equipping us to be more, be more effective in prayer. And you know, when it comes to Dr. Swan, and his delivery style, I'm just so impressed with his humor and his dry wit. And uh, in honor of him, I, I thought I might start this morning by telling you guys that for my New Year's resolution, uh, I have decided to put a gym in my basement. I'm just not sure yet if he's going to pay rent. <laughs> See, he is the only one that can get by with that stuff. This morning, I want to talk to you about perspective and as we discuss that, what we've been talking about really since the first of the year is that we are believing God collectively as a church that this is going to be a year of renewal and direction. I have met so many people that seem to be in need of renewal. Um, they are spiritually, physically, emotionally exhausted. In fact, in one conversation recently, I learned that even though we're on the other side of the pandemic and 2020 is behind us now some three years, if you will, some of you are starting to realize that you you're, you're really are exhausted. You didn't even know how tired you were in trying to figure out how to navigate these challenges and dealing with a decreased workforce and all the other hurdles that you've had to, to jump over and, and, and jump through. And I want you to know, I believe with all of my heart that renewal is a possibility. At the same time, I've talked to a lot of people that seem to me just to be needing direction. Their people are confused. They don't know what their next step should be. They don't know what they should do next. They don't know what their purpose is. They don't know what their calling is. They don't know what it is that God really wants from their family. And I believe with all of my heart that this can be a year where God releases direction to you. However, the best ways to receive renewal and direction from the Lord are to be in pursuit of God. And that's really what the, the message series has been unofficially titled up to this point, is the pursuit of God. And we launched it on the first Sunday of the year by talking about Moses and how that he was a man that was in pursuit of God. And the reason that he was is because he was in need of renewal and direction because he was spiritually, physically, and emotionally exhausted. And he starts praying this prayer of, God, I want to see you. And God honors Moses' purity, and he responds to Moses' passion, and Moses gets to see God. But one of the things that happens with Moses during that moment is that his perspective is completely reshaped. And I think that that went on to greatly enhance Moses' ability to lead and serve others as well as God. And so this morning, what I'd really like to do is, with the help of the Holy Spirit, show you some ways that perspective might be enhancing your relationship with God and how that it might also be negatively affecting your relationship with God. Perspective. Look over somebody and tell them, it's not what it looks like. It's not what it looks like. I uh, heard the story of a young couple that decided, you know, they just wanted to start over. They've been watching YouTube adventure videos, and they've decided they just want to kind of get off the beaten path and go live in Alaska. The guy was an engineer. The woman was a marketing executive. Upon moving to uh, Alaska, they purchased a small cannery where they were going to can and sell salmon. There was only one problem. Once they started this process and they sold their first cans, the customers discovered that the salmon inside, instead of being the desirable pink, was actually gray. And so the wife goes to the man. She says, you're the engineer. You've got to figure this out. And so he starts surveying the processes and trying to figure out what might be causing this. And she comes back to him. And she says, well, do you have it figured out yet? He says, well, yeah, unfortunately, this is a technical problem. And this is going to take about 10 months to fix. And we're going to have to invest a bunch of money into new machinery. And she said, not only do we not have the money, we don't have the time. Like 10 months, we will be bankrupt. And so she decides she's going to take two days. Think about it. And there's nothing wrong with the taste of the salmon. It's just gray instead of pink. So she decides that on every can, in big, bold letters, she's going to put the only salmon that doesn't turn pink in the can. <laughs> Started selling like crazy, and they became extremely successful. Perspective. 
want to show you a verse. Isaiah chapter 58. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours and my thoughts than your thoughts. What I believe that God is trying to explain to us is that heaven's perspective does not always line up with human perspective. That there may be a way in which that God is thinking about something or God is viewing something that we don't see it the same way. And that could be a problem. We talked about earlier how that God affected Moses' perspective when he allowed Moses to have that experience with him on the mountaintop. And what we know about Moses is that the only father figure he had in his life was Pharaoh. And Pharaoh was a mean man. He was hateful. He was a killer. He was a guy that had facilitated genocide across an entire nation. And what we've learned is that Moses kind of sets a precedent probably for the rest of us that our experience with a natural father tends to shape our perspective of the heavenly father. So it's interesting that when God revealed himself to Moses, the first thing he did is he showed Moses his mercy and he showed him his goodness. I think the reason God did that is because he was trying to let Moses know there's a perspective of heaven that you must have that does not match the perspective that you have in your human experience. That the heavenly father might be very much different than your natural father. Perspective. Tell somebody one more time, it's not what it looks like. You know, Webster's Dictionary defines perspective in this way. It says, perspective is the way in which a subject or its parts are mentally viewed. I'm going to read it again for the sake of emphasis. Perspective is the way in which a subject or its parts are mentally viewed. What that means is that when you're talking about perspective, you're saying the mental viewpoint that you have of something. The issue with that is that you could be viewing something in your mind a way that is very different than reality or what's actually happening. And that seems to be what God is trying to tell us, is that you could be viewing something in humanity very different than the way that heaven chooses to view that thing. Isaiah 55 verse 8. Read it again. See what he says. For my thoughts and your, are not your thoughts, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Perspective might be affecting your life far more than you realize. It could be affecting your relationships. It could be affecting your career path. It could be affecting your prayer life. It could be affecting your relationship with God. It could be affecting the way that the Lord is using you to minister to other people. Perspective. It was a shoe company. They decided they wanted to enhance their sales distribution. They, they discovered this foreign territory. It was somewhat of an underdeveloped nation. And they send in two salesmen. First salesman goes in. He surveys everything, takes a look at it, and he replies back via email to the corporate office. Prospect here is horrible. No one wears shoes. Second salesman surveys the same country, checks stuff out. Then he sends his email back to the corporate office and says, market potential terrific Everyone is barefooted. Tell somebody it's not what it looks like. What is the perspective that you're taking towards things in life? How have you been viewing things? There's a girl, she went to college. She was kind of getting her feet under her, but it came time to write an email back home. She had finished her first semester. This is what she wrote. She said, Dear Mom and Dad, just thought I'd drop you a note to clue you in on my plans. I've fallen in love with a guy called Jim. He quit high school his sophomore year to get married, but a year ago, he got a divorce. We've been going steady for two months, and we plan to get married in the fall. Until then, I've decided to move into his apartment. I think I might be pregnant. At any rate, I dropped out of school last week, although I'd like to finish college sometime in the future. And then enter, 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 several spaces down, the, the email continues. Mom and Dad, I just want you to know that everything I've written so far in this letter is false. None of it is true. But Mom and Dad, it is true that I got a C- minus in French and I flunked my math class. And it is true I'm going to need some more money for my tuition payments. Perspective. Tell somebody it's not what it looks like. You know, I try to be a guy that I'm going to preach something 
that I've in some way tried to allow the Holy Spirit to deal with me on a personal level with that subject. I don't ever want to preach something that I'm not at least trying to live. And I'll be honest with you, uh, just in my natural DNA, perspective, a heavenly perspective versus a human perspective is something I can really struggle with at times. And so this week, knowing that I was preaching this message, I, I, I've really been seeking the Lord of like, okay, God, where's somewhere that I really need this on my personal level? Where is a place you need to reshape my perspective? So Friday night, uh, I had to run out for an errand. I ran into a general store. Um, I just need to pick up a few things. And I'm one of those guys, I don't want to get a shopping cart because then I might overspend. You know, you step into all those spontaneous purchases. You meant to get three things. Next thing you know, you got a whole cart full. So like, I'm not going to get a shopping cart. I'm going to discipline myself. I'm only going to get what I need. And then I discovered they had two liters on sale, two, do, two for $2.50. And I thought, well, I need four of those. And then I realized they had Captain Crunch on sale, and I sell with the captain. I got me a big box. And then I realized they had Diet L8 on sale, and I'm like, you know, I feel like a man, go out to the garage, you know, pop a cap and have me a L8. Now I'm loaded down. Only they got more stuff for sale. And they sing, I know I've grabbed a handful of other items. I make my way up to where I check out, and I discover they only got one cashier and one self-pay station. And this line is coming all the way back down the aisle. I think, man, this is probably going to take a while. Three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes. And you know what starts to happen. It starts to get heavy. It starts slipping out of your hand. You start repositioning it. I reached the point where I felt like I was in an exercise class instead of trying to check out. And finally, I noticed that the cashier, she's moving people through her line, but the self-pay system, the same person has been there for 10 minutes. And finally, I, I'm behind this individual, and she's maybe in her late teens, and I realize the reason it's taking her so long, she's texting. She's standing at the self-pay station with three or four things in her bag, texting and I'm like what is wrong with this generation like no awareness whatsoever to the fact that we're all standing in here in line that there's more people that need to check out do you not see that I got my hands full won't you at least invite me to set some stuff down texting I realize she actually has heard this thing ding she has put in her debit card and then she goes back to texting to the point that it stops the transaction because she's left the card in so long and I'm thinking, I don't know who raised this girl, but I'm about to help. <laughs> and I felt like I heard the Holy Spirit say, what if it's not what it looks like? And so, mustering a tone and an empathy that is not my nature, I just leaned forward and I asked the girl, I said, hey, sis, are, are you finished? And she turned, it looked like crocodile tears were starting to form. She said, no. No, my boyfriend has run off. This card is locked up. And I understood her to say, I don't know how I'm going to get this stuff for my baby. And so I said, well, do you mind holding these two liters for a minute? I think we're both going to need to use this card. And when I went home, I couldn't help but to think, like, what if my inner jerk had prevailed? Like, like what if I, I had lashed out or said something hateful? And, and I just wonder, like, how many times do we miss divine appointments and kingdom connections because of having the wrong perspective about things, about painting the wrong mental picture of whoever it is we're encountering or whatever it is that we're experiencing. I think we really do need to give some consideration to the fact that God's thoughts are not always like our thoughts, and we may need to surrender whatever it is that we think to what it is that God may want to be do through us or speak to us. Now, here's the thing. This isn't just about when somebody else is going through stuff. you, you got to realize you got to have the right perspective when you're going through stuff and when you're experiencing a struggle. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul said, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. That's perspective. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. That's perspective. We are hunted down, but we are never abandoned by God. That's perspective. We are knocked down, but we are not destroyed. That's perspective. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. That's perspective. Maybe that's why Paul continued to the book of Romans and he said, and dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. In other words, let God impact your perspective, the way you see things, the way you engage with other people, the way that you even view the experiences that you personally are going through. I feel like I need to ask somebody this morning, which window are you looking through? It was a couple. They went on a little getaway. They went to a cottage. He was in the living room. He's looking out the window. He sees the swimming pool. He yells in the other room, hey, honey, I think we should go get some exercise. She's in at the kitchen sink just doing a handful of little dishes. She looks out her window. She sees people playing pickleball. She says, sounds great. She comes out dressed for pickleball. He comes out dressed in swimming trunks. Why? Because perspective is determined by the window that you're looking through. And so my question for you is in your life, like are you looking through the window of humanity or are you looking through the window of heaven? Because that's ultimately going to determine how effective you are in your walk with Jesus Christ. There's some things that I've learned about perspective. Number one, Perspective chooses the needs we meet. Perspective chooses the needs we meet. The way you are viewing something in your mind is going to directly affect whether or not you are going to help somebody. And I think what we forget is that Jesus said that when you do it unto the least of these, you have done it unto me. And we forget sometimes that when we are clothing the hungry, when we are feeding the naked, and when we are helping the prisoner, that Jesus is spiritually receiving that on behalf of that individual's physical need. Perspective. I think a lot of us might handle things differently if we didn't lose sight of the perspective that when you do it unto the least of these, you have done it unto Jesus. Another thing about perspective is it selects the souls we win perspective selects the souls we win when is the last time you sought wisdom to win the soul of anyone other than your family the reason that we don't do that is because we don't view people as eternal beings we, we encounter people every day and don't realize that every single person we meet will spend eternity in one of two geographical locations heaven or hell and what if you are the individual that God wanted to use to redirect somebody's life. But we don't choose to look through eternal perspective. There was an atheist, a, a, an evangelist went up to him and he was trying to share the gospel with him and, and tell him about heaven, tell him about hell, tell him about Jesus. And the atheist just looks back at the guy and he says, I don't believe in God and you don't either. The evangelist said, what are you talking about? I'm telling you about Jesus. I'm telling you about the gospel. I'm telling you about God. What do you mean I don't believe? He said, you don't believe in that heaven and hell stuff because if you did, you would crawl across broken glass from New York to L.A. and back again to keep one person from going there. Perspective. I've learned that perspective determines the disciples that we make. Matthew chapter 28 is the Great Commission. What we forget is, is that that is some of the last words that Jesus Christ ever spoke while he was on earth and he gave them directly after he resurrected from the dead. It's pretty important and it's not written in a suggestive tone. So do you look at small groups like they're a place to hang out and just chill or do you look at them like they're a place to be discipled and help make discipled? disciples? Do you view Sunday morning as it's just a box that you check to make yourself feel better about yourself? Or do you view it as that's a place where I'm going to go, I'm going to be enhanced in my discipleship, and then I'm going to go live my life out in a way that better reflects Jesus Christ in the earth? It's, it's how do you view it? Perspective. I've learned that perspective shapes the room that we make for God and others. God will only be able to move in your life up to the level with which you are willing to create room for him. And a lot of us, we go to God and we're like, hey, God, fill me up. 
And I think the Lord would say, where's the room? It's almost like we want God to speak over the noise of everything else instead of turning everything else down so that God might whisper and we would have him at hello. But what happens if you notice people's lives, our lives, it's when we go through circumstance, it's when we go through challenge, then we're ready to make room for God. What do you want me to get rid of, God? What do you want me to move out, God? How many days do you want me to fast, God? How many prayer meetings do you want me to show up at? Why? Because hell's breaking loose and we know God better show up and we can't fix it. But what would happen if our perspective changed? And we began to realize, I'm going to make room for God before something goes wrong because I realize I'm going to need him regardless. Here's what I want to show you. This church, our mission is to seek the lost, to disciple the found, to make room for God and others, and to meet needs. But I hope what you realize that I just showed you is the only way that we can be effective in that mission is if you as an individual yield your perspective to the Lord. And you start to see seeking the lost, discipling the found, making room for God and others, and meeting needs as something that is a heavenly mandate upon our lives collectively. And I want to thank you for giving of your time, giving of your talent, giving of your treasure. Do you realize that every single Sunday across three locations and multiple services, it takes over 800 people? Every single Sunday, over 800 people are confirmed to serve in this church. Thank God for you. Thank you for saying that you're going to live this thing out because everyone needs Jesus. Come on, can I get an amen from somebody on a Sunday morning that recognizes Everyone needs Jesus. It's perspective. It's perspective. Every kid needs Jesus. Every young person needs Jesus. Every marriage needs Jesus. Everyone needs Jesus. Do do you live your life with that perspective? I'd like to talk to you just a little bit more about perspective. And really what I'd like to do is transition into kind of trying to show you that some of the greatest warnings in all of Scripture are directly connected to perspective. The success or failure of false prophets is affected by perspective. Listen, you don't have to be a great theologian who can take people from Genesis to Revelation and back again as you homiletically bestow upon them some hermeneutical exegesis of end-time eschatology to be able to determine we're closer to the coming of Jesus today than we were yesterday. Like We are, we are in a place... Or that there has to be a recognition that that the end times are in some capacity upon us. Now, what that looks like in totality, there's no way we can fully describe. But there will be, according to Scripture, in the last days, false prophets who arise and they will begin to deceive people. It'll tell people what they want to hear. They'll tickle their ears. Why? Because the devil wants to steal, kill, and destroy and to populate hell as much as he can. The way Jesus said it would happen is Matthew 24, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Think about it for a minute. Most people would think if somebody showed up and did a miracle or somebody performed a sign that appeared to be supernatural, they must be of God. But what Scripture tells us, you've got to have the right perspective from a biblical understanding that just because somebody can do a miracle doesn't mean they're of God. That's perspective. And how many people don't hold the proper heavenly perspective. And how many people will be deceived because they didn't nurture a heavenly perspective? Another thing about perspective, the presentation of what love is and what it is not is affected by perspective. The presentation of what love is and what it is not is affected by perspective. I'm going to read this because I want to make sure you hear me clearly. In a time of alternate lifestyles, the ideology of love wins is presented in an attempt to say everyone is entitled to live their own truth. But the heavenly perspective is this. Love only wins if it is spoken in truth because knowing love is not what sets you free. We are made free by knowing truth. Ephesians says we will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. 
so clever that they sound like truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Jesus added this, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And so we say that we love people, but we will not speak truth in love, speech filled with grace, seasoned with salt, to the point we would risk the relationship to try to save the life. I'm now a dad of two teenage kids, and I spend... I can't tell you how many times I reflect upon this in personal prayer time and repent of it to this day. That I spent four years of my teenage life barely speaking to my father because he knew who I was meant to be before I did. And he risked his relationship with me through love to try to save my life. And I rebelled and I revolted, but I never stopped respecting because I knew I knew that in there somewhere, there was a truth that could not be ignored. And when that truth finally took hold, the Spirit of God showed up and there was liberty and there was freedom that could only come because somebody risked the relationship to save the life. And we have a watered down thing happening in the earth today where that the church has decided to be so seeker friendly that it's no longer spirit sensitive. And what's going to happen is there's going to be a bunch of people split hell wide open with a cracker in one hand, a cup of juice in the other because nobody else ever actually preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not trying to sound mean or hateful. Like there's something in me that is concerned and something in me that is stirred that says at some point we got to rattle our spiritual cages and wake up to the realization there's only one way to be set free and that somebody's got to love you enough to tell you the truth. And they shouldn't do that egotistically. They shouldn't do that self-righteously. They shouldn't do that unnecessarily harshly, but they should do that with love. But you can't have love without truth. You'll never be free. I'm sorry that wasn't in the notes and it's the first time I've said it all day. But uh, there you go. There you go. Russell Springs is just kind of like a warm blanket. It's like coming home. You don't realize the perspective it took to even sit in this building today. Started in the storefront with six people. Two years in, we had 30 Eight years in, people coming, didn't have any, we didn't have any money. We couldn't build the building that we needed. People would drive through the parking lot and leave because they couldn't find a place to park, doing three services a Sunday. And I remember like being so mad at God. We can't even get the building that we need. I went to a church. I visited another church, and, and the guy got up. The pastor got literally got up on a Wednesday night and said, I'm just here, church, to thank, you, thank God and testify. We have paid off $30 million in debt. And I thought, are you kidding me? Like, I don't need 30. I just need one. I got so mad I don't remember anything else I said the rest of that service. I just sat there and pouted. I got ready to leave. I was walking out. I'm going to pause the parking lot. This woman I've never met before in my life, never seen her before, never seen her since. She runs me and my wife down. She grabs me. She hands me a $100 bill. She says, I don't know who you are, but the Lord wants you to know that you're not waiting on him. You're waiting on people, and this is the first seed. She put a $100 bill in my hand. She had no idea the faith that it did. I was coming home. It was a seven-hour drive. I called our entire leadership team. I said, everybody meet me in the backyard. We're going to gather around my fire pit, and we're going to seek God. We're going to get vision. We're going to get direction, and we're going to put a shovel on the ground, and we're going to believe God because we're not waiting on God. We're waiting on people. And today you sit in a $2.5 million project that was started with $9,000 in the bank. And the reason that it happened is because at some point we had to shift our perspective and realize God wasn't pushing us down or holding us back. He was waiting waiting for us to step out on water and I'd rather be a water I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat talker any day you got to change your perspective who look at somebody and tell them it's not what it looks like I sat there through that service sold up and pouting because I thought God loved that pastor more than me and he probably does but the perspective had to be shifted how many times have you pouted through life well, they, they, they like her better than me. Well, he got my spot. And I don't understand he always gets the promotion. And he just come from the right side of the tracks. And I didn't. And I got the wrong last name. And Maybe your perspective's wrong. And maybe your perspective is the thing that's holding you back. Just look at somebody and tell them it's not what it looks like. I'm somewhere in these notes. i got to figure it out. <laughs> Number three, relational 
success is directly affected by perspective. If you got a relationship that's struggling, I almost guarantee you your perspective is off somewhere. And at some point, you may have to bring your perspective about that relationship and lay it on the altar and ask the Holy Spirit to help you examine it. Because here's what Jesus said. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eyes when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye and then you'll be able to see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. The way one man encapsulated that is he said, when the other person acts that way, he's ugly and mean. When you do it, it's nerves. When she's set in her way, she's stubborn. When you are, it's just firmness. When he doesn't like your friends, he's judgmental. When you don't like his, you're discerning. When she tries to be accommodating, she's brown nosing. When you do it, you're just using tact. When he misses a deadline, he's apathetic. When you do, you're striving for excellence. When she picks up flaws and points them out, she's critical. When you do it, you're just offering wisdom. When other people take a long time to do something, they're slow. When we take a long time, we're thorough. When they don't do something, they're lazy. When we don't, we're too busy. When they succeed, they're lucky. When we do, we deserve it. Perspective. What if... It's not what it looks like. I'll give you another thing. The enemy's success against you is affected by perspective. The swans taught us that brilliantly on Wednesday night, that who you are in Jesus Christ directly affects your success in your prayer life and your spiritual journey. You think about perspective. There was an entire Israelite army that looked out at a giant named Goliath and came to the conclusion, he's so big, we can't kill him. David comes up with a different perspective, looks at the same giant and says, he's so big, I can't miss. Perspective. What if it's not what it looks like? I love war history and battles and study of generals. And I ran across this, this story of a, a general named Creighton Abrams. He was leading a campaign in World War II, and he found himself and his army completely surrounded by the enemy. He's an optimistic guy. He gathered his soldiers together, and in the middle of the speech, he told them this. For the first time in the history of this campaign, we are now in a position to attack the enemy in any direction. Now, some of you have felt like you were surrounded but you forgot that greater is he that's in you than he that's within the world. So maybe it's time to grab the sword of the spirit, the word of God, stick it under the nose of the devil and start taking enemy held territory. Pick a direction and move forward in the name of Jesus. When you are dwell in the secret place of the most high, you abide under the shadow of the almighty. And scripture says a part of that promise is that angels will be encamped around about you. But if a single angel didn't show up, you and God make a majority and that changes everything to the point you can decree blessing in the place of curses because he will be the author he will be the finisher he will be the alpha he will be the omega and his anointing will destroy every yoke i think about elisha he woke up one morning he was surrounded by the enemy his servant was freaking out the enemy's everywhere what are we going to do elisha prayed about it god showed him this army of angels that were around him he went and prayed the servant was still freaking out he said god please open his eyes so he can see what i see the eyes eyes were suddenly open he realized wait a second there's more for us than there are against us what if it's not what it looks like. What if things haven't went right and some stuff has went wrong and there's been a struggle and there's been a challenge? But what if all of that was just the Lord allowing a little chastisement here and there to get you on fire, get you wound up, get your passion stirred to where you're done playing games with God in 2024 and you're not going to waste another year? I don't know who I'm trying to help this morning. But somebody, somebody needs to realize what if it's not what it looks like. I'm going to ask them to come play some music and I will get out of your way this morning. But I need to say one final thing to you. Your eternity is affected by perspective. 
One of the things that the book of Ecclesiastes says that God desires to do is put eternity in the hearts of men. I think part of what that points to is the Lord wants you to realize that there is life far beyond the temporal. And that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, Scripture says that what you do in the temporal can lay up treasures in heaven. That when you are sacrificially obedient in this life, you are laying up treasures for eternity. We lose that perspective. So we get so caught up in what it is we're going to do in life and what we're going to put in our 401k and what toy we're going to buy next and where we're going to take all these things and do all this fun stuff. And we forget that the heavenly perspective says that when you are humble and honoring of God in this life, you're actually laying up treasures in heaven. That's, an, that's a perspective that's important. I give you one, just one final thought in this vein. Your perspective is affecting your eternity as well if you're not yet saved. Because you could be deceived into thinking you got a lot of time left. And yet I've said this before, and it's, it's the truth. I guess it's just the way my schedule and my life has worked out. But I have, in, in my 25 years in ministry, I have done more funerals for people 35 and younger than I have for people 35 and older. No man is promised tomorrow. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to give you some evangelistic rattle trap. The truth of it is, I could be the last preacher you ever hear. And if that is the case, like, where are you at in your relationship with God? Now, others of you, you're not putting it off because you think you got more time. You're putting it off because you think there's a bunch of stuff you got to get fixed. And I need to get this resolved, and I need to get that fixed, and I need to get this other thing worked out, and th then, then I'll worry about the God stuff. Best advice I ever got when I was in that stage of trying to contemplate being born again and what that meant for me, a guy came up to me and he said, Gilbert, man, you don't get good to get God. You get God to get good. And it changed my life. And I realized there wasn't another thing I had to work out. I didn't have to figure out the, the, the bad habits and the, the hurts and the hang-ups. I just had to come and lay my life on the altar, and he'd take care of the rest. And this morning, like, I don't know if anybody believed me or not, and I don't guess you need a disclaimer. But any pastor worthy of salt wants to grow a church. But you learn in trying to grow a church that you come to a place where there's a real tension between telling people what they want to hear and telling people the truth. And you have to make sure that when you go into that truth phase that you're not just ranting and carrying on for the sake of trying to get some sound bite or to beat people up. So I want you to understand something. When I'm as straightforward as I am this morning, it comes from, I realize it takes different things to get different people's attention. And there'll be days to be all soft and cuddly and warm, and that'll work for somebody. But I was a guy, somebody had to coach me up. Like somebody had to just get in my face and just tell me, dude, it's got to change. And I think this morning, that's what this moment's about. It's somebody that, that's the language you speak of like, just give it to me straight. It's not what it looks like. I went through my, I went through a section of my life absolutely convinced that God could not use me and that he would not want me because of what had happened to me in my childhood. But one day, at mile marker 82, 
all of those things that had been so straightforwardly spoken to me culminated in one moment. And two weeks later, I preached my first sermon, and I've been preaching ever since. And my point to somebody this morning is this is a culmination moment for you. This is a mile marker 82 moment for you where you realize that your perspective up to this point has negatively impacted your eternity. And I just want to pray with you. And I want to pray for you. God, everyone needs Jesus. And yet today, God, I feel like that there are a handful of people that you have singled out to which you only know who they are and what their names might be and what walk of life they come from. And Lord, I believe right now that your spirit is dealing with some people in a very deep and a very rich way. As they begin to recognize, I don't need to put this off any longer. I don't need to try to figure this out and figure that out and play games with God in this regard and that. I just, today, I just need to get right with you, Jesus. And I pray, God, that they would find the courage to lift a hand, not so a preacher can see it or a church can count it, but so that heaven will know connected to that hand is a heart that right now is stopping in the running away and surrendering and saying, Jesus, I need to be saved and I need to know that I'm saved. God, give them the courage. Lord, let them get past the perspective of what this person beside them is going to think or what these people around them are going to think and just give them the courage to right now surrender their life. And now God, shape their perspective that You died on that cross so that you could set them free from heaven's wrath against sin. And you loved them so much that you gave your son. And now, God, if they will receive that truth, decree and declare you with their mouth to be the Lord of their life, and follow you the rest of their days, God, they can pass through the birth canal of salvation and leave this place different than they came in. Lord, let it be done. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. God, somebody right now needs to rededicate their life. They need a fresh start. Somebody else, God, they've been saved maybe even for a long time. They walked in here knowing they were in a relationship with you, but Lord, right now they're convicted. Their perspective has not been godly. There's places in their life their perspective has not been heavenly. And right now, God, I pray that they would begin to repent and ask you to renew and to refresh God, I thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You care to look at somebody one more time and just tell them it's not what it looks like? It's not what it looks like.